So in today's video, I'm gonna be showing you how we turn an old, ugly block concrete wall into this. So stick around and I'll show you how we did it. Shoot a bit of an angle at the center. So this is a long awaited project. I've been meaning to do something with this wall for the last couple of years. Now we could get it rendered, which is fairly costly and you still end up with a fairly slabby looking wall. Um, we could face it with stone. Now if we were gonna do it with kind of full width depth stone, that's very expensive and quite a lot of tying into the wall and things like that, probably some extra footings. We could also look at cladding it with some of the stone veneer type options. They never look quite right um, in this sort of setting. So I think the most simple thing for us to do is to clad it with timber. We're gonna go horizontal with our cladding and I'm gonna install vertical battens onto the wall in order to fix it too. First job then is to cut these to height. We're, we're steps down, this wall steps down every few meters uh, as we go down the garden. So we'll try and position our battens accordingly. I'll stop the battens just above ground level because we don't really want ground contact if we can help it. So that's 2.9, 3.2. So if we drop a meter and a meter, time's pressing on, as always, limited, limited time. Swimming lessons begin in half an hour. Not for me. Um, so I might be able to get a few of these up just at that point. So that's that one. Now, loads of options for fixing, so you could plug it, you could use thunderbolts, or you could uh, do all sorts. But in this uh, application, I'm just going to use concrete screws, probably the easiest way. And yeah, you could pre drill the battens, but the SDS should fly through them quick enough. Not sure if that's off or my brickwork's off. No, it's bang on. Dodgy block work. Okay, I actually think some of the block work done in the 50s is probably better than some of the other stuff done nowadays, but don't want to make any enemies. Okay, swimming calls. Failed there, didn't we guys? Never mind, it's always tomorrow morning. Change of plan, been let off swimming today. Got my helper, you ready? Yeah! Wow, we're cooking on gas now. They're, they're really solid and fortunately, this section of the wall well, the section we're doing at the moment is pretty flat, so we don't need to worry about packing them out or anything like that. How many are there on the wall? One, two, yeah. You don't have to touch it, but how many was there? Are you going to touch them all, are you? Okay. Four. Four, great. So we've got four. We need to do some more along here. What I want to do is level the top so that I can cap the top with a little uh, kind of capping rail. That'll stop two things. One, well, mainly it'll stop uh, water getting behind and trapped in there. But because we're leaving spaces between our kind of rain screen type timber, 
it should be able to kind of there'll be lots of airflow behind there but also if uh, because i'm leaving these kind of shadow lines between the boards if i allow sunlight to get down behind you may be able to see the brick wall the block work through it anyway so what i want to do is kind of put a capping piece along there so it makes like a nice dark shadow behind the boards <laughs> Right, I think we can call that a good evening's work. Oh, I'm loving the, the light evenings again. I get so much done. So what um, I really wanted to get done is the section I've done, which is about eight meters, just under eight meters. I can go a little bit further. I may have enough timber to do that. And what I've done, well, we'll have a look at it tomorrow, but I've got different width boards so we can kind of make it random, um, just rather than just being a slat board all the way up. Uh, we'll kind of vary it, mix it up. But that looks pretty good. We'll trim down so we've got a nice join on that straight batten there. I'll tell you what, I will give you a push if you help me pack up my tools. Oh. Deal? Yes. yes. So close. So close. One, two, three, four, five, six, eleven, twelve, thirteen. Oh, that wasn't. <laughs> three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. <laughs> yeah, now we can have a high five. Ready? Anyway, there we go. Let's pick this one up tomorrow. All right, we're back for our second instalment. I think we should be able to get the boards on most of these sections uh, if it's going to go as well as it is in my head. So I've just uh, unloaded all the boards. I'll show you those now. So I've just turfed them out of the van and put them here for now. But you can see. There are some 100mm boards, so four inch, and some wider ones, which are basically gravel boards, so they are 150 or six inch. And now the cat's trying to take center stage. A few options as far as fixings, we could hammer them by hand, uh, just with some normal kind of 50mm ring shank nails, uh, which would be adequate. We've also got the nailer, the big Hitachi nailer, and I've got some 50 mil nails, which I, I might try, but I have got some decent external screws and it's as quick as that anyway. I haven't come across many tools better than this for that sort of grubbing out the roots type work. It's got a matic on one side and a maul on the other. I think that's got matic. Um, it's just one of the fiberglass roughneck tools, but you can do some serious damage to, to roots when you need to to hack it out and also if you're going to get a root ball out from a tree you know around the stump if you've cut down the tree chop all the way around and get right under it with that before you dig it out i mentioned yesterday about putting some landscape fabric down here which would be a sensible idea but we kind of like the idea of growing um things up a trellis here and I don't really know where we're going to do that yet. So I think we're going to leave it as it is. We've got a deep mulch, bark mulch going here. And we've also got some willow, like a willow arch to, to plant down here. So I'm going to leave it as it is. I'll probably regret that decision when I'm picking weeds out in a year or two. But if you were going to do that, you could lap it up the wall behind the battens, screw the battens on. And then you know nothing's going to get up behind the, the fabric. 329 at the bottom. Thank you, thank you to the decent builder who built this wall. Square all the way up. So 329, once again, curse of the messy workshop. Can't find my speed square, which I was going to use as a guide just for the circular saw, but we'll manage.
One thing I did consider doing is ripping some down on the table saw to give me a third width. But of course, as soon as you start cutting into a fresh treated board, you're exposing the, the virgin timber and it's just not gonna last quite as long. Okay, now common sense would say work from the bottom, spacer in, next board spacer, and let gravity do the work. Um, but of course, that'd be too easy. What I want to end up with is a full board at the top rather than end up with a slither. So a little bit like tiling, there's a bit of forethought that needs to go into it. I'm actually going to start on this level, knowing that I've got two boards to go in above, and then probably work down from there. Put another thin one on and we'll get the boss out. And I know what she'll say. She'll say, yeah, it looks fine. And then, several months from now, we'll be sat out having a patio barbecue and she'll say, why are the gaps so big? I would have done them much smaller than that. Why are you in this? Because you're the boss lady. <laughs> Remember that the tops are going to be capped so there'll be no light going down the back. Does that make sense? So where, and where you see the spaces, they'll be gone. So it'll be a solid black line. And I was thinking it'd be quite nice to put a hooks in yeah, yeah, to hang stuff on. Yeah. So do I get a thumbs up, boss lady? Right, so I've got these brads holding it up for now. And the reason why I've done that, or one of the reasons, apart from just being handy, is I really think you can make or break a fence or cladding with your fixings. I see so many really nice, well, decent new builds or um, like extensions where the cedar cladding or whatever's gone up and there's been no thought process in as far as the, the spacings or straightness of the nails or screws. And it's probably just me, probably just me having a little moment, but I think it's worth spending the time just mapping it out and then firing them all in at once. And by using the brads, it means we can tack them in place. Then we can run a line or you could do a string line, a chalk line, and then you know things are going to look okay. So the screws I'm using are the Turbo Gold uh, exterior ones. So they're green. They're a bit like decking screws, but they're shorter. So they're perfect for this. I use them on a picket fence as well. Now, I think they stand out too much. We could use a much smaller trim head screw, or we could now, or we could stop being fussy and just get on with it. All right, just a matter of curiosity, I'm gonna see how much the uh, ring shank nails disappear. It's probably going too far. Or actually, they may be too long. I think they're 55s. Shoot a bit of an angle. So they're, they're brown to start with, which kind of out, or gold-headed. Oh, what do we think? I think I'm gonna go full circle and go back to the nail gun idea. They, no, they're actually too, too long. Right, <laughs> I've given in, been to pick up some nails. Uh, I had a little play around with the nails that are in there. I think they're 60 something mil um, because I use them for the roofing. And you can see on this test strip that they were just coming through too much. And the thing about these nailers, big framing nailers, is you can, you can cause a little bit of damage by the the fact that these have got quite a spiked nose on them to, to grip you in, unlike a rubber nosed brad nailer. So if you're quite gentle, you can kind of get away with not putting those prongs in too much. I mean, there's just little cuddly chickens everywhere. Oh, 
that's number one section done. I'm now kind of working out whether I work from the bottom up. It would probably be easier, but we've got one right over there. So I think I'm going to sit the same because I like the idea that we finish neatly on the top and we don't have to cut any boards down. So yesterday I finished the second bay or section and we've just gone just beyond our last batten. So I need to cut down and as I said, I'm gonna try and cut them in situ. Now, now what I've done in the past in this situation is use the, uh, the poor man's track saw, which is the, the jig, which is a sheet of ply or strip of ply with a, a batten running along, uh, which you ride the side of this along and it gives you a zero clearance sort of cut on the edge. But because we're potentially going to cap this and I fancy my chances of being fairly accurate going up here, I'm just going to do it by hand. We just need to make sure we set the saw depth. Probably go a tiny bit. I mean, that is 21 like I wanted, but I reckon we go in a little bit further. That is, that is exactly what I was looking for. We haven't even nicked the button. As I do more and more DIY and work like this, you begin to, to realize these little bits that make it more efficient. Running them long like that is just so much quicker and actually you end up with a much nicer finish, straighter line. So if you're doing decking, same thing again, just leave all your boards long and then do it ideally with a track saw or uh, or just by eye like that it's great let's try and get back into our rhythm even though we've got a tree in the way Right, last little section here, and I'm hoping that we can use up the leftover bits. We're already way further than I thought we'd get. And then once I've done this section, we can look at what's left, what I still need to buy, and work out a bit of a cost per metre. So this is looking back up, and between each of the joins, I will be putting a capping piece. Uh, and I've intentionally not carried on the the pattern so here's where we started last night and since then we've done a little willow project that'll be a future video but as you can see it follows all the way down to the first pier so that section is completely done and then the next section is basically another two and a half 3.6 meter bays the bottom of the the paneling I've stepped it just like the top is stepped uh, to account for our sloped garden. Now all of this is going to be deep bark mulch by the time I've uh, chipped a load of the apple prunings and the hedging and, and that'll bring it up to here and I'd much rather, I mean so the, the, the staggered bits will be covered but I'd much rather it be bark up against there which is freely draining uh, so it, uh, basically we've got absolutely no soil contact, battens or panels all the way up so it's going to last a lot longer. So cost-wise, we've got over 12 and a half meters here, running meters of uh, the, the boarding, cladding, whatever we're calling it. Um, and the total cost was 240 pounds plus fixings. So I did have to go and buy a handful of nails, but um, 240 pounds for that. 
To compare that to other options, obviously stone is a lot more. Cladding, other options, feather edge, um, sorry, um, shiplap and tongue and groove from the same sawmill worked out a little bit uh, less, but it's thinner. And yes, it's smooth, but with if you're exposed at all with the sun in the middle of summer, that stuff can really shrink and you can end up with gaps. This is really solid. We're going to be able to boot footballs against this all day long and hang stuff on it. We can have lighting down here, hanging baskets. I can build those hooks I mentioned to slot in there. There's all sorts we can do. And the benefit of having something solid to fix to is, is quite a, a big one. Also, uh, cost wise we could compare it to fencing panels if you were lucky enough to have only a six foot high wall uh, or a 1.8 meter high wall and you could just use straight board panels if you if you think about a decent quality heavy duty uh, panel they're probably about 40 pounds i would say uh, 35 for a feather edge type uh, or, or more for more decorative so let's call it 40 pounds for something half decent uh, by the time you bought the battens to go behind it now you'd need that's 1.8 meters round it up let's say two uh, so you'd still need six or seven of those six at 40 so a bang on a uh, similar sort of comparable pricing whether it's fencing panels or something bespoke like this the benefit we've got is by going in singular pieces we've got a high wall over the height of a fencing panel we can also drop it down with our wall and follow the contour of the the stepping so that's the plus point over fencing panels but by all means if you've got a if it just happens that they fit then that would be a, a fairly quick way to do it as well but it wouldn't be quite as heavy duty as this so there we go i've got a load of tidying up to do i'd love to hear what you think about the style and the project it's a little bit modern uh, for an older house like this but I kind of don't mind it because it's down the lower half of the garden and I think it's going to uh, weather quite nicely in grey of course you could stain it and do whatever you want to it but I think for the time being we're just going to let it uh, soften down as always any tools I've used especially my two best friends those nailers which came in handy I will stick down below but please don't be put off all of this is possible with the simplest of tools and I think it's pretty much a basic DIY project. But that's it, it's tidy up time for me. So remember, if you can, do it yourself. And we'll see you next time. Oh, and if Joe and I have finished our willow weaving anniversary present to each other, uh, that video will be at the end of this one. Otherwise, stay tuned, subscribe, and you'll be able to find it as soon as it's uploaded.